Welcome to Studio Tulsa. I'm Rich Fisher. My guest today is sociobiologist Rebecca Costa. Her book, The Watchman's Rattle, has been compared to the best work of Jared Diamond or Malcolm Gladwell for its ability to explain large societal trends and shifts. She'll be delivering the University of Tulsa Collins College of Business Distinguished Lecture Thursday on Why Fast Adapters Win. She'll be joined by IBM's Program Director for the Big Data Project to discuss how to capitalize on emerging trends before they become readily apparent. Costas' book, The Watchman's Rattle, A Radical New Theory of Collapse, examines our current political gridlock and divisive rhetoric in context to historic civilization collapse. Central thesis is that our society's communication and information complexity, the sheer amount of information out there, overwhelms our brain's evolutional ability to make sense of all this data. and makes us, and by extension, our leaders, prone towards wrong-headed decisions. Costa will be speaking Thursday at 2 and again at 7 p.m. in TU's Helmer Call. Both lectures are free and open to the public. And she joins us today on Studio Tulsa. Rebecca Costa, welcome to Studio Tulsa. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Before we talk about the Watchman's Rattle and, and a lot of your work, the Obama administration just released their Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies, or the Brain Initiative, which is going to map the human brain. About $100 million to spend that. Given your background and how you really believe that brain evolution and the idea of problem-solving new technologies in the brain is important for our future. What do you think of this idea of, of mapping the brain and really getting this research out there? I think it's the only competitive economic advantage that matters. If you take a look around the world right now, you'll see that every civilization that is advanced is succumbing to complexity. We just simply cannot deal with the overload of information that's coming our way. We, there's just no way to take advantage of it, according to uh, Eric Schmidt the um, president of Google, um, you know, we're generating as much data every 48 hours as we did from the dawn of humankind to year 2003. And in, in that kind of an environment, there's just no way that we can load that kind of content or even discern it or use it to our uh, advantage at all. So I think that the country that figures out how to load content and help people be able to use that content to their advantage is uh, really going to um, win the competitive uh, uh, environment. Now, uh, while the brain initiative is, I've seen most of the talk has been about maybe looking at Alzheimer's, I think a secondary and perhaps one of the main thrusts is to really understand how our brain processes information and probably get to the sort of thing that you've been writing about as far as the third form of problem-solving insight, which you've been watching brain research, and what we're learning about our brain is just amazing. Well, that's right. I mean, one of the things that we have got to come to terms with is that there has been a narrowing that has occurred. We now think that every problem we have is either political or economic in nature. <laughs> if we just make more money and get better leaders, all these problems will go away. But the truth is, is if you go to every country, they're all struggling with the same problems, uh, energy, jobs creation, uh, illegal immigration, uh, education, uh, political gridlock, terrorism, you know, rising violence. I mean, they all have the same problems. So if the problems were economic or they were political in nature and they all have different political and economic systems, you would think they'd have different kinds of problems, wouldn't you? They wouldn't be the same. So at some point, a light bulb's got to go off, and we've got to realize that what we have now is a species-wide phenomenon that is occurring, and it's not economic or it's not political. What we have is a symptom of progress moving at a faster rate than the brain can really absorb or adapt. In other words, there's a gap between how fast the human organism can develop new capabilities to adapt to its environment and how fast human progress occurs. And this gap has been encountered before. I, I argue in my book that it is the gap between the rate at which those two clocks operate that has caused the ultimate downfall of civilization. There comes a point in time where progress moves beyond what the human organism is designed to effectively manage. And when that happens, the, the society and its leadership becomes overwhelmed and succumbs. 
And I believe that at the core of every downfall is really a biological problem, uh, not, not ultimately, you know, when, when you strip everything else away, human societies and even organizations cannot progress any faster than evolution will permit. So if that's the case, then we've got to use whatever tools we have, including neuroscience, to figure out how we can evolve the brain and arm the brain to be able to handle an increasingly complex and chaotic environment. And you're right, over the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been looking at, well, what tools do we have that earlier civilizations might not have? And I was able to come upon a new discovery in neuroscience called insight. And it appears to be a third form of problem solving ideally matched to highly complex and chaotic uh, problems. And, uh, and so, you know, this is the solution that I present in my book. So I'm very excited about this brain initiative. Before we get to insight and what promises it holds, let's look at some of the signs that indicate that our brains are falling behind on complexity's demands. I think of the financial meltdown where if you ask 100 people what was responsible for the financial meltdown, even knowledgeable people, They'll be like describing the elephant. They'll be able to tell you a a part of the elephant, but they won't be able to describe the elephant in its hole. Well, of course. I mean, we have people now going on 60 Minutes that are responsible for investing for the, you know, largest pension funds in the world, and they're claiming that they're buying derivatives that are so complicated that even they don't understand what they're buying. I mean, we have people like Nancy Pelosi. I don't want to pick on her, but, you know, she puts her hand on this health care bill, and she says, boy, I'm really glad we passed it, so now we can read it and figure out what's in it. <laughs> so, so at every turn, you know, whether it's the tax code, which nobody can figure out, nobody can hardly do their taxes anymore. I mean, we, we have the option to do our own taxes, but only a fool would do that, the same kind of fool that would try to represent themselves in a court of law. So we just have a point right now, whether it's medicine or the legal system, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. At every turn, it just becomes so complicated that uh, we really can't be responsible. Uh, We're told we should be responsible and make adult decisions and good decisions, but how do you make good choices in that kind of environment? And, And by the way, this is nobody's to blame for this. This has happened before. And you asked me, well, what are the earliest symptoms? I wasn't interested so much in the cataclysmic event that shoves a civilization over the cliff because I, I think we, get, we romanticize those events and, and we get too focused on them. I think by then it's just too late. I'm interested in what are the earliest markers that were making that slow drive toward the cliff because, as everybody knows, if you can catch the symptoms early enough, you can take preventative measures. And so that is what my book was about. I went back and looked at the Khmer civilization, the Mayans, the Romans, and I thought, well, what were the earliest symptoms that they were headed toward collapse? And it turns out that we now know there are three early detectors. The first is that the civilization becomes gridlocked. They know what their problems are, and they actually have solutions, but they become unable to act on them. The second is that things become so complicated and convoluted and unwieldy that there's a confusion over what is an empirical fact and what is an unproven belief. And then the third symptom, which is the most dangerous, is that public policy begins to be formed by unproven beliefs rather than empirical fact. And at that point, the civilization has made itself vulnerable for some cataclysmic event to shove it over the cliff. So we now know that it's gridlock, a confusion between facts and unproven beliefs and opinion. Public policy is then shaped by unproven beliefs and often by false prophets. And then the fourth uh, event is collapse. So it's not that interesting that a society or even an organization uh, will collapse. I mean, you know, that's not that interesting that there is a huge calamity which causes it to fold. I think it's much more interesting to look at what were the conditions that set them up for it. It's interesting. You know, you look at our country's history. We've actually had that before. I think when you think of uh, the 1850s and slavery leading up to the Civil War, I guess that was our collapse, really. Absolutely. We can see it in every civilization. As an example, let's use the Mayans because they were many, many years ago. And 
and people don't, you know, they don't feel I'm playing political sides when I use the Mayans. But, you know, they had a civilization that was 3,000 years old, not a couple hundred years old. And during all that time, they knew that they had a tenuous relationship with rainfall. So uh, a lot of people go down and look at the great Mayan temples, but what they really ought to look at is these massive reservoirs that they built. They were unprecedented hydraulic engineers. And so they knew that when it rained, they had to save water in order to water their crops and in order to be able to grow the civilization. And so they even built underground cisterns to keep the water from evaporating, and they developed the first refrigeration systems. They put their food down in the underground cisterns so that it wouldn't rot. But you can see that at the same time that they were pursuing all of these uh, man-made rational remedies, they were also practicing fetishism. They were making sacrifices to the gods to bring the rain. But you can see that after about 2,000 years, the Mayan civilization begins to make a turn, and they begin to rely almost exclusively on fetishism to bring the rain. As the droughts get worse, they abandon building any further cisterns. There's no more attempt to perform water conservation. They build no more reservoirs. And instead of sacrificing captured slaves, they turn on their own people, first the infirm and the old, then they move to uh, you know, young uh, men, then they move to young women, virgins, and then eventually, just prior to the Mayan collapse, they are murdering uh, just newborn infants because they're unspoiled and they think that this is what the gods require to bring the rains back. So we can see that they make a, a terrible shift away from empirical remedy to unproven beliefs, and then the society collapses. Interesting. My guest today is Rebecca Costa. She's a sociobiologist and the author of The Watchman's Rattle, A Radical New Theory of Collapse. She will be the University of Tulsa's Collins College of Business Distinguished Lecturer this Thursday. Two presentations, actually, at 2 p.m. and 7 o'clock, and both are free and open to the public, be held at the university's uh, Helmerich Hall. And she's our guest today on Studio Tulsa. You've lined out these three early signs of collapse, and it says out of those three early signs, we come up with five sort of super memes, if you will, the reason why we can't get beyond grip lock, why we substitute belief for fact. Uh, before we talk about those, what about the idea that instead of substituting belief for fact when we can't grasp facts, what about the fact that belief is sometimes more comforting than cold hard facts? Well, the human organism needs both, right? I mean, right. by beliefs, we're not just talking about religious beliefs. You know, when you put your money in the bank, you believe it's going to be there when you go to take it out, and maybe one day it won't be. Uh, when the traffic light turns green, you believe it's safe to cross. Uh, in New York, they don't even wait for it to turn green. They just start moving. It's about the time it's going to turn green. That's how you can tell a real New Yorker, right? So, you know, we have beliefs about – scientists have beliefs, right? They call them hypotheses. Every scientific discovery has started out with a belief, and then we went through the diligent process of getting empirical evidence to support the belief or, or to disprove it. Uh, so going way back to the earliest days when we were in caves, uh, we drew pictures, uh, hieroglyphics to you know, help us make women more fertile, to uh, catch larger prey, defend us from evil. We, we've always been an organism that when where fact drops off, uh, we have no choice but to uh, embrace belief, and beliefs are comforting. And they're, um, by the way, from a cognitive standpoint, a belief is very easy. You either believe it or you don't. To prove something now is a, is a very taxing exercise for the human brain. So I don't have any problem with beliefs or, or empirical fact. Uh, th these are both part of human nature. The problem becomes when we abandon empirical fact or we become confused about what facts are and we pursue beliefs instead. You know, uh, the fact that man is not the center of the universe and the sun doesn't revolve around the earth was an inconvenient fact. And so we persecuted people because we would rather hold on to the unproven belief. Now, those exercises have always proven to be not in the best service of humankind. Well, let's talk about these super memes. Uh, one is uh, irrational opposition, and that means looking more for the flaws and the possible remedies than actually searching for the solutions. That seems to really, really describe government today. <laughs> well, sure. 
Sure. Uh, there are certain behaviors which emerge prior to a civilization's collapse, and, uh, and I describe five of them which seem to be occurring in society today, and you happen to point out irrational opposition. You know, when you oppose everything, when you find the flaw in every remedy, when you find a reason to shut down every possible prescriptive idea that somebody has, that's the equivalent of gridlock. You can't have any progress. Progress is fundamentally flawed, just as evolution is. Think about it. We have millions of species of a particular type of bird, and then the environment changes, and some of those birds had what was required to survive, and some didn't. So in reality, you know, all progress, all evolution, is based on tremendous amounts of waste and flaw. And this is the history of human progress. So just ask any venture capitalist. For every 100 companies they invest in, uh, they only expect maybe 10 or 15 to uh, provide any fruits. But yet in that high failure rate environment, they're still able to be enormously successful. So one of the things that we have to understand is that you cannot get to a point where you're just shutting down every possible solution because uh, that turns into gridlock. And that is the soil, so to speak, where we set ourselves up to, um, to follow unproven beliefs rather than you know, follow policy based on fact. So trial and error needs to be a part of solutions. Well, one way to look at complexity, I love this definition because all the other definitions I've ever looked at are too complex <laughs> to understand. <laughs> Uh, and by the way, anyone listening, don't bother to buy a book on complexity because they're too, they're too complex. I've to read a couple books on complexity, and it, it yeah, it makes yeah. your head hurt. <laughs> yeah, it makes your head hurt is right. So I love this definition because it lays out the scenario that we are each dealing with. Complexity is best described as there are just simply more wrong solutions than right ones, and the number of wrong ones are growing exponentially every minute of every day. That means every minute of every day I'm becoming a more incompetent picker. And it doesn't matter if it's the stocks I'm picking or the doctor and the treatment I'm picking, the pharmaceuticals I'm picking, uh, the school for my children. It, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's getting more complex, and so my odds of picking correctly are going down. I call this a high failure rate environment. Now, naturally, we're all trying to survive a high failure rate environment where the odds are getting worse and worse and worse. We have technologies to offset that, things like search engines that will help us drive down to better data. And we have experts and authorities that we can turn to to help us, you know, sift through areas of specialization where we may not have that capability as well. But even they are overwhelmed. We now have the number of deaths from misdiagnoses going up in hospitals. And we have people in our nation's capital voting on nuclear energy when they've never taken a physics class in their whole life. You know, in, in an environment like that, we're all struggling. So when I see people do things like try to hang out Hillary Clinton for what happened in Benghazi, I ask them, is there any question in your mind that millions of urgent communications are coming into the State Department every second of every day, and we're now trying to cull through and determine which are the ones that we have to take action on immediately? I don't think it matters who you put in that position. I think that they're in a high failure rate environment. You know, and when you look at the important issues confronting humans, like climate change, in our country, educational reform, you know, making sure everybody has a job, uh, you know, making sure that we sort of rise all boats in the financial tides. It seems to me that there needs to be lots of solutions because we're really bad at picking really good ones. And this gets to another super meme you talk about, which is extreme economics and the fact that economic feasibility drives every decision in determining a valid solution. It seems to me if we're so bad at picking them, we really need to stretch ourselves to offer more solutions and, and test them. Well, that's right. One of the solutions I talk about is using the venture capital model when we have a complex problem we're trying to solve. Venture capitalists start out funding 100 companies, and they give them a first round of funding, and then they evaluate them, and they cut that down to maybe 50% for second round funding. 
because many of the ideas they had and many of the companies that they invested in, the technologies or the developments didn't prove themselves. They went a little bit down the road and said that doesn't work. Uh, that is infinitely better than doing this in a serial mode while you run the clock out. As an example, the Gulf oil spill. You know, first we went in there and we dropped a uh, concrete box on the hole and we waited 30 days and we said, no, that didn't work. And meanwhile, all of us are watching these massive mushroom Hiroshima-looking clouds <laughs> of oil come to the surface in one of the worst ecological disasters of humankind. So. You know, it, it, and then we waited 30 days, and then we decided we were going to siphon oil off the side, and another 30 days passed, and we said no. And, and the third solution was static kill, and that seems to have held fine. But imagine if that was solution number 80. We'd still be watching the oil seep out of the ground uh, even today. Now compare that to the rescue of the Chilean miners. They realized that they, again, had a time-sensitive, mission-critical disaster on their hands, but rather than putting their resources in a singular solution and hoping that they had picked right in a high failure rate environment, remember, your odds of picking are not good no matter how much due diligence you do, as venture capitalists understand. So in the Chilean miners situation, they went in with 16 rescue plans and they went all out. And the 16 proved not to all be valid and that went down to 15, 14. And even when they rescued every single miner successfully, they were still pursuing three rescue plans in tandem, full bore. So that's the way it works. The funnel starts out large with solutions. And then as they empirically prove they, ca they are invalid, uh, as you're moving forward, then you have to get down to those solutions that will actually produce results. But think about this. That requires a tolerance for failure and for waste, right? right. One solution works out of 16. In the case of a venture capitalist, maybe 20 programs work out of 100. We don't have a tolerance for that. We find one failure like Solyndra, and we blow it out of proportion and completely devastate the solar energy business in the United States. You know, if we're not going to have any tolerance for failure, if we can't come to terms with the fact that every solution we invest in is not going to produce results, we cannot move forward. My guest today is sociobiologist Rebecca Costa. Her book is titled The Watchman's Rattle, A Radical New Theory of Collapse, and she will be a distinguished lecturer at the University of Tulsa Collins College of Business this Thursday at 2 and 7, two presentations at Helmer Hall, and both are free and open to the public. And she's our guest today on Studio Tulsa. Earlier we sort of mentioned this idea of getting our brains to be able to better handle complexity, and it's it's an evolutional process is how you describe it, but you describe this third form of problem-solving insight in which you can actually, brain scientists are actually able to look at a person's brain as they are solving a complex problem. And just before they understand they have the answer, you can watch these new parts of the brain light up as, yeah, as, they're, as they're coming to grips with the answer. And you say this is an important breakthrough. This is a huge breakthrough because when you think about it, it's not until very recently we could put a skull cap on your head and watch <laughs> what your brain was doing as it hit sort of a limit of left and right brain problem solving. You know, the left brain is deconstruction. It starts with this many solutions, and it narrows it down to you get to one or two, and you pick one. And the right side uses more synthesis. You know, I, I'm talking to you, and I see a little bit of sweat above your lip, and I realize you're lying to me. Uh, you know, so uh, th th these are the forms of problem solving we've developed over many, many millions of years of, of human evolution. But what's exciting is, is that for many years, we decided that things like Newton and Apple falling on his head and discovering gravity, or Archimedes sitting in a tub and the water overflowing the tub's uh, sides and discovering displacement theory, we decided those things were sort of folklore. They were accidental. They were genius inspiration. But what we're discovering is there's actually a third form of spontaneous problem solving where we connect two pieces of information in a way that we've never connected them before to solve a very complex problem in a very elegant way. And it's, it comes on like a freight train. It's just a, a sudden, spontaneous connection of data and a solution. And as you pointed out, we have now gotten to a point where 
about uh, 300 milliseconds before you're going to have a breakthrough, we see a small part of the human brain called the ASTG light up like a Christmas tree. And anybody who knows about science knows that when you get to a point where you can actually predict that an event is going to occur, you're really on to something. And so we now know that this form of problem solving is ideally suited to highly complex and chaotic problems. So what do we do with this information? Well, now, remember, I said you, you're going to connect two pieces of content. So if that's the case, if you've never taken a class in physics, you're not going to come up with some brilliant inspiration <laughs> in physics. <laughs> right. That, that, you know, that ain't going to happen. It doesn't come out of nowhere. You have to have the content. So if that's the case, then what we must do is we must figure out how to load content in, in a way that's memorable and accessible to the human organism. And that's where I think the real breakthroughs are coming in neuroscience because we now have neuroscientists discovering that the brain, like everything else in our body, wants to be warmed up before it accepts difficult content. So just like you wouldn't run a marathon without stretching and hydrating and, and exerting yourself, your brain doesn't want that either. So there are any number of these brain fitness tools, and I'm not talking about the kinds that uh, gaming companies put together, but there are a number of brain fitness tools. I'm fond of the ones that are up on Posit Science, P-O-S-I-T, that were developed by Dr. Michael Mersnick, who was one of the neuroscientists that did the original work in brain plasticity where the brain rewires itself after an injury to be able to perform functions. So... And what it does is it basically warms up all the different parts of the brain. And, and then they've done experiments where they've had people, you know, try to learn things, foreign languages, math, all kinds of things. And they've discovered now after uh, four years of having brain fitness used in public schools for about 15 minutes in the morning before kids uh, in grammar school start school, in Jacksonville County, they've discovered those children now have twice the academic achievement with no change in textbooks, classrooms, curriculum, anything else, just warming the brain up in the morning, they're able to absorb more. What's even more exciting is that they've now instituted brain fitness in some um, assisted living homes, and they've discovered that those folks are having far few car accidents because they're warming up their peripheral vision before they get in and start their cars. Wow. That's so there's a lot of insurance companies that are looking at this, and I, I believe it's not, it's not too far down the road before they'll have a uh, brain fitness location that you can log into, and if you'll just play the games, the video games, for 10 minutes before you go out and start your car up, you probably get a discount on insurance. <laughs> I, I think that's what they have in mind. <laughs> Well, it is a really interesting new world. The name of the book is The Watchman's Rattle. You can hear Rebecca Costa this Thursday here in Tulsa at the University of Tulsa. Rebecca Costa, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Sociobiologist Rebecca Costa speaking with us here on Studio Tulsa. Her book, The Watchman's Rattle, A Radical New Theory of Collapse, is available in softcover. She and Gary Robinson, Program Director for the Big Data Project at IBM, will be the University of Tulsa Collins College of Business Distinguished Lecturers on Why Fast Adapters Win. That will take place Thursday at 2 and 7 o'clock in Helmer Hall on the TU campus. The lectures are both free and open to the public. Well, that's Studio Tulsa for today. Our program is produced and edited by Scott Gregory. The views of our guests and commentators are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of KWGS or its licensee, the University of Tulsa. I'm Rich Fisher. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.